Hi everyone, Creveen here from CIT's Blackrock Castle Observatory. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at where we see the sun, moon and planets in our sky and how we can use their motion across the sky to figure out the time of year. We're going to be looking at the ecliptic, which is something we took a look at in some of our shorter Twitter videos earlier this week. If you'd like to get all of the most up-to-date notifications on the videos that we post, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that little bell icon next to the subscribe button as well. So we're here looking into the southern sky at just after 10 o'clock this evening. This weekend is going to be quite a good time to take a look for the ecliptic because we will see the moon very close to the south at just about 10 o'clock, nice and early in the evening. And it's right in front of the constellation Leo. Leo is one of the constellations on the ecliptic. So we can see the moon here just in front of Leo on Friday. It's in the middle of Leo on Saturday and just under the tail of Leo once we get to Sunday. And the moon orbits around the equator of the Earth. The equator of the Earth and the equator of the Sun don't line up perfectly, but they are very, very close. And the Earth, we orbit the Sun's equator at a particular angle. Other planets may orbit the Sun at a slightly different angle, but generally it is a slight difference for all of the planets. Dwarf planets like Pluto can orbit the Sun a little bit more eccentrically. But planets like Venus, objects like the moon, we're going to see them on the same part of our sky as each other and the same part of our sky that we see the sun. This is the ecliptic, so I'll bring up the ecliptic line and we call it the ecliptic because if the earth, sun and moon line up perfectly straight, the moon will be on the ecliptic because the earth and sun are lined up on the ecliptic. So for the moon to line up with us, it has to be on the ecliptic as well. And if the moon is directly behind us, we get a lunar eclipse. If it's directly in front of us, we get a solar eclipse. So the ecliptic is where we see eclipses. And by looking at the moon and how and when it's passing the ecliptic, that can help us figure out and predict eclipses as well. We can see the moon here is a little bit above the ecliptic. Sometimes it's a little bit below, but it's always very, very close. We can see that Venus is a little above the ecliptic here. The planets as well can be a little higher or a little lower lower, but they're always very close to this line. This line has some of the most famous constellations. I've already mentioned our lovely constellation of Leo here. We've got Gemini just on the other side of Leo. The bright star Spica in Virgo is just down there. Some of the other constellations are a little bit fainter or a little bit lower. So we can see Cancer there between Leo and Gemini. We can see Libra there just underneath Virgo. Aldebaran, uh, from my view here, is a little bit behind a tree, but if you don't have a big tree like this, you should see Aldebaran and Taurus just above the setting sun. So these are the ecliptic constellations. The moon and the planets are very close to the line, but because this line is based on the sun, the sun is always on the line. So if we come back to daytime and bring the sun up into the sky, well, it's a little bit bright. Let's get rid of that lovely blue sky, which should make things a little easier to see. Here we go. We're looking into the darkness of space with the sun just in front of the constellation of Aries. So the sun is in front of Aries for the early part of May. But as we come to the end of the month, it's going to move into Taurus. It's in Taurus by the middle of May and it's leaving the top of Taurus as we come to the middle of June. After June, the sun will move into Gemini for most of July. It spends a little bit of July in Cancer the Crab and it's moved all the way into Leo by August and this repeats every single year. The sun isn't moving here, it's us that are orbiting around the sun. So once we've made a full year's orbit around the sun, the sun will end up back in front of the constellation that it was in front of when we started. So here on the 1st of May 2020, the sun is just in front of Taurus. If we went all the way through to the 1st of May 2021 or back to the 1st of May 2019, the sun would be in front of Aries and moving into Taurus as well. This repeating pattern allowed ancient people to figure out the time of year, but of course you can't actually see the stars and constellations during the day. So you have to wait for the sun to set, take a look at what constellation appears to be above the sunset. It looks to be Taurus there. 
and then you'll have to get up early in the morning. You'll have to get up early for sunrise, which of course, for many of us, might not be the easiest thing to do, waiting until the sunset to go to sleep and getting up as soon as the sun rises. But for ancient people, this may have been a little bit easier. So we can see Pisces there, and next to it, Aries. We saw Taurus in the evening, Pisces and Aries in the morning, so the sun must be right there in Aries. We weren't able to see Aries when the sun was going down, because the sun was setting with Aries. They were in line with each other. So by using these constellations at sunset and sunrise, ancient people, particularly the ancient Greeks, were able to figure out the time of year. So the ancient Greeks weren't using it to figure out eclipses, so they didn't call it the ecliptic. They had a different name for it. As you can see, a lot of the pictures are animals. We've got Aries the ram, Pisces the fish, Taurus, of course, is a bull. We have a scorpion. We have Leo the lion. So the ancient Greeks called this line the circle of animals and the ancient Greek for a circle of animals was a zodiac. Most of us today would say zodiac. So in astronomy, we call these the zodiacal constellations. The ancient Greeks didn't exactly practice astronomy the way we practice it today, but they did look at the motion of the stars and planets and they did use them to predict things like the time of year. So these are our zodiacal constellations. One of the least famous is right here in the south early in the morning for the next few mornings. This huge constellation is called a Fuecus. Only a tiny bit of a Fuecus passes the ecliptic. So a lot of people forget about a Fuecus, but if we counted all the constellations that cross the ecliptic, Counting a Fuecus, we'd count 13. There are 13 constellations that we call the zodiacal constellations because they're along this path where we see all of the planets. There's Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars in the morning. It's where we see Venus. It's where we see the moon. And for ancient people, it helped them to figure out the time of year. Now, the zodiacal constellations, they of course do have a slight relation to the signs of the zodiac. Since ancient Greece, the practice of astronomy and the practice of astrology have drifted apart until we have barely anything in common. But we do have just enough in common that the list in the back of the newspaper that talks about signs of the zodiac, you can use that to find the zodiacal constellations in the sky. It does take a little bit of practice, but I'll help you learn how to do it if you join me for our next video.